Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. Sometimes it takes me a little longer to put out a show, not because of busy schedules or things going on at work, though those have totally been reasons shows have been late in the past, but no, sometimes the reason is, you know, I just don't get a show out on time because I'm working on and figuring out the thing that I want to talk about on the show. So while I try and make it clear that I'm not an expert on, well, anything I talk about on this show... I want to make sure that I have a firm understanding of the topic. I don't know about you, but I've listened to some podcasts and some speakers at conferences where it seems like the hosts have barely read through the about section of a topic's website. I find it infuriating when I listen to a show like that, when I obviously know more about the topic than the host or the hosts do. So in an effort to keep that from happening here, I'll take my time with something. I want to get inside of it and draw out ideas. I don't feel the need to try and think outside of the box or anything. But if I'm going to talk about a thing, then I should know how that thing works, right? It all comes from a point of view sort of explained by Kurt Vonnegut's first rule of creative writing, which is to say, use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she does not feel the time was wasted. I would rather hold a show back then throw out something ill-informed, you know? Especially in a situation like this, where the topic is a little more cyberpunk than librarian. So this is something relevant to my interest because it involved Raspberry Pis. And if you're new to the show, well, hi and welcome. But those who've been here for a few episodes know that I really dig Raspberry Pi computers. They're just so freaking useful. They're cool, they're small, they're multi-purpose, and... They run a wide variety of software to do a wide variety of things. And they're portable. Wait, portable? Sure, they're small and you have to plug them into a wall, right? Well, of course you do. But where we're going, we don't need walls. Right, let's talk about Raspberry Pirate boxes, shall we? This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 44, Portable Piracy. I'm Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersections of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, listeners and friends out there in meat space. Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the fiber and burning up your podcatcher from the deserts of the Southwest. So, hey, it's wonderful to finally finally get back in front of the microphone and spend a little time with y'all. And I think I've got a show you'll really like. As the show moves forward, I've been wanting to explore the cyberpunk side of Cyberpunk Librarian a little more than we have been. And fair warning, sometimes those shows won't be as useful to librarians as other shows are. But I promise to try and keep things balanced and useful all around. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about pirate boxes and making one using a Raspberry Pi. Now, Dan, you might be saying, what the heck is a pirate box? Well, good question. Some others might be thinking, pirate box? Why doesn't he cover the library box instead? Well, that's also an excellent question. And hey, believe me, it's going to come up. But for those who are just kind of getting started, let's talk terminology for a minute. Originally, a pirate box is a little project that you can throw together using a small wireless router, some open source software and firmware, and a little time. Basically, the software on the router creates a website that you can access by connecting to the router as a hotspot. Since the router itself isn't connected to the internet, you're hooked up to an offline network where you can do things on that network, but not on the net. Now that's by design. 
So what can you do? Well, a pirate box offers a few things to the user. We'll get into that more later, but the, uh, the prominent feature is the ability to share files with other users. Now, you can pre-populate the pirate box with files at the outset, but users can also upload files on their own. Since the user interface is a website, all you need is a browser. Now, that means working, you know, it works on everything from a computer on down to a smartphone. Say what you want about the power of apps, because apps are awesome and apps are powerful. But when you have all of your traffic going over port 80 using HTTP, you can make that work with this year's upcoming iPhone 7 to a 2011 Galaxy S2. There's power in specialization, but there's a lot of power in openness, too. Beyond that, a pirate box offers a simple chat facility and a more persistent forum area. While the chat can be, you know, a fleeting up-to-the-moment thing, the forum hangs on for much longer. The great thing about all of this is you can set one up fairly easily, and then all you do is plug it in. Check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, where you'll find several links, but one of the first will be a link to the instructions on building one of these for yourself using an inexpensive router and a USB drive. It's a really slick device, and the parts and pieces fit in your pockets, especially if you happen to wear cargo pants. Now, the Raspberry Pirate Box is literally the same kind of thing, but rather than building it on top of a small wireless router, you're using a Pi. It'll do all the same things. All you need is a Pi, a USB flash drive, and a USB Wi-Fi dongle of some kind. And for a guy like me, the Pi is a better platform, not just because I think it's capable of doing more than, a, than you know, your standard Wi-Fi router, but because if I'm being totally honest here, I just understand the Pi a hell of a lot better than I do a tiny router. Networking is not my, my A game. So, okay then, mates, now that you have a basic idea of what it is and a basic idea of what it does, let's dive into the thing and see what we can do with it. Raspberry Pirate boxes are small, highly mobile file sharing systems. You can carry one around with you in a cargo pocket, jacket, or backpack, and it'll never weigh you down. Heck, I would defy you to put one in an empty backpack and then be able to tell the difference in the weight. But the genius thing here is that the Raspberry Pirate box doesn't actually need to plug into a wall, though you'll, you certainly can if that's what you need to do. But both versions of the Pirate Box, the router and the Pi, can work off of a mobile battery charger. You're going to need one of those battery chargers that's powerful enough to charge an iPad or some other tablet device. Look for the 5-volt models either at your local electronics or mobile shop or on Amazon. Myself, I have an inexpensive Mercury Innovations model MI-PB602. It outputs at 5 volts, 2.1 amps, and has a capacity of 6,000 milliamp hours. It's got two USB ports on the front of it for charging devices, and a micro USB to charge itself. It switches on and off with a push-button switch, so if you don't need it, it's dormant and ready. It also, weirdly enough, has a flashlight on it, because why not? I guess... This thing will power a pirate box, router, or Pi for hours. You can gather it up in a bag, or maybe a custom box that you make, or something like that, and you can quite literally just carry it around with you. I'm carrying one in my backpack, and with, the, uh, with a decent Wi-Fi dongle, you'll get quite a bit of range around you. It's meant to be hyper-local, and it's hard to physically locate. So, okay, great. Let's take a look under the hood of the Raspberry Pirate Box so we can see what we're dealing with. The Pirate Box itself uses Raspbian as its underlying operating system. 
Now, if you've used a Raspberry Pi, then chances are you've used Raspbian, or you at least know about it. The great thing about Raspbian, at least for me, and others kind of like me, is that it's based on Debian, and so is Ubuntu. So if you know how to use Ubuntu or Debian Linux, you'll have a pretty good idea how to use a Raspberry Pirate Box. Once you're set up and running, and you know, you're running on your Pi, you'll not actually do a whole lot with it in the local sense, as the architecture is set up for you to run it as a headless server. In other words, you're going to use Secure Shell on another computer to manage your Pi remotely. If you're using OS X or a Linux machine, no problem, SSH is built right in. On Windows, you'll need an app like Putty, unless you've got that new build of Windows 10 where, uh, yeah, Microsoft is incorporating the Bash, set, the Bash shell into Windows. That new build where Microsoft incorporated the Bash shell into Windows. Good lord, that's a set of words I never thought I would string together in a sentence. So, if you're looking at making one of these for yourself, you're going to need a bit of familiarity with Raspbian, SSH, and how to work your way around a command line. If you can do that and follow the rather simple instructions on the Pirate Box website, links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, you can get one of these set up and running in about half an hour or so. It does not take long at all. So with that in mind, let's have a look at what we need to do to make one of these things, right? So... If you've worked with a Raspberry Pi before, you know you can flash the micro SD card with various operating systems and utilities. Raspbian is a popular choice of operating system, but you can get media servers that are ready to go, Ubuntu Mate, Ubuntu Snappy, Arch Linux, and others. Back on the show about setting up digital signs, I talk about flashing the card with a disk image already set up to run Screenly OSE on Raspbian. That process is awesome because it makes everything so simple. Well, guess what? You can just download a disk image that's already set up to run the Pirate Box software and flash it to the card. Put the card in the pie and boot it and you're almost there. I mean, it is that simple. You you are far more than halfway there once you put the flashed card in the pie and plug it in. But before you do that, there are a couple things you're going to want to do. By all means, hit up the show notes for a link to the image. Download it, flash it, and have your micro SD card ready. But you're going to want a couple more physical things. Like I said, you're going to need a USB Wi-Fi dongle that's compatible with your Pi, and you'll need a USB flash drive. Now, before you boot your RAS Pirate Box for the first time, make sure those things are plugged into the Pi, because on the first boot, the Pirate Box software will be scanning for those things and getting them set up for you automatically. So, once everything comes online, check out your smartphone or computer and you'll see a new Wi Fi network called Pirate Box Share Freely. Connect up to that network and then bring up your web browser. Now, okay, theoretically, your device, whether it be your smartphone or your computer or tablet or whatever, should redirect any URL you put in the browser to the Pirate Box website. We'll talk a bit about that later, but to go straight to the Pirate Box site, you can just type piratebox.lan, that's L-A-N, into your URL bar and hit enter. And if all goes well, you'll see the Pirate Box homepage. Now, like I said, you're not really going to use the RAS Pirate Box locally. You're going to need to get into the system via SSH or secure shell. So open up a terminal window, or putty, and you're going to go to secure shell into alarm pi as the user alarm. In other words, you're typing ssh space alarm at symbol alarm pi. So secure shell alarm at alarm pi. The default password is, no surprises, alarm. Everything is lowercase, so there's no uppercase anything in here, so don't get confused about that. But now you might be thinking, good lord, I need to change that password for sure. That's easy to guess. What, what else do I need to do? Hey, don't worry about it, because you are literally provided with a handy checklist when you log in. Most of it is basic stuff, but the cool thing is, is all of the commands are literally provided for you right there in the terminal when you log in. You can copy and paste. 
But for the curious, you're going to change the password for that user. That's literally the first thing you do. Disable network time sync because you're not connected to a network anyway. Run the pirate box setup scripts that gets everything set up and running. Enable and set up the forum. Enable USB drive sharing so you can use your USB drive as a storage unit instead of just it sitting there not doing anything. And enable a UPnP and DL DLNA server and set it as a service. This lets you stream media off the pirate box, which is pretty freaking cool. Seriously, all you have to do is follow the directions on the screen. After you're done, reboot the box with a pseudo reboot and reconnect when it comes back up. And with that, you are set. Right. So, okay, we're up and running in quite literally just a few minutes. Um, I had to actually uh, reset a Raspberry Pirate box because, well, I kind of screwed something up, but we won't talk about that. I just screwed something up. That's all you need to know. Uh, so I had to reset it up and you know, I decided to time myself, you know, starting from scratch. I re-downloaded the image, all of that. So it's just like I was, you know, sitting there with all of the toys, but nothing was set. And it took me about half an hour. And most of that was just downloading the disk image and then writing it to the micro SD. So, okay, now that we've got the Raspberry Pirate box up and running, let's take a look at what it offers. As I said earlier, the power of the pirate box comes from port 80. There's no need to worry about apps and compatibility when all you need is a browser. When you first open up the pirate box on your Raspberry Pi, you're going to see a simple little website. There's a welcome message explaining what a pirate box is, and that that can be dismissed by the user. They'll see a chat window, a facility to upload files and browse the files already on the box, and a bar showing the current disk space usage. All in all, the simplicity makes for a site that loads very quickly. There's only one image, and it's a small pirate box logo. So most everything you see is simple, formatted text. The chat feature allows a user to remain anonymous or to add their name, but they can add any name they want. They can also pick a text color to help differentiate their messages from others. It's a bare-bones chat feature, but it's set up that way on purpose. Everything about this front page is built with speed and ease of use in mind, because this could be used by anyone from, you know, someone on a state-of-the-art MacBook Pro to someone on a six-year-old Android phone or something like that. The chat messages are only retained for the uptime of the pirate box itself, so if your system is rebooted, everything is cleared. Now, obviously the big draw for this entire object of tech is the file sharing capability. Downloading a file from the pirate box can't be much easier as you're simply presented with a list of files and you click the one you want and there you go. The download starts and transfer speeds, of course, depend on many factors like how close you are to the box, what kind of Wi-Fi dongle is being used, the signal strength the size of the file, and the number of other people who are also connected and downloading. Uploading a file is just as easy. There's a big friendly button there to choose the file on your system, and then it uploads it to a shared directory. As soon as the upload is complete, that file is immediately available for download. Finally, beyond the chat window on the front page, the Raspberry Pirate Box offers a more persistent form that hangs on longer than the chat does. Surprisingly, this isn't a forum like Discourse or PHPBB. After all, the web server powering the pirate box isn't using anything fancy like a MySQL database or PHP or anything like that. Instead, the developers opted for the Kareha image board. Now, if you have no idea what that is, just go take a look at 4chan, because Kareha is very similar to that, except it runs without the benefit of a database. Indeed, Kareha is just a uh, collection of scripts and modules written in Perl. 
Like any other image board, you can upload an image and start discussions. The chat feature on the front page has no ability to do anything with images. So while you can roll with a straight vanilla Raspberry Pirate box, you might want to do a little work behind the scenes to make yours look nice. If you're anything like me, you're going to want to put some files on it yourself, just to begin with. I uploaded a bunch of stuff, and then I got into the share directory and created subdirectories to categorize it. This is, of course, over SSH. Within the web browsing interface itself, it doesn't have any ability to really interact beyond uploading and downloading. Since you can't choose where a file goes on upload, it makes it a little easier to find things if they're in some kind of logical directory structure. After that, you might want to poke around and change some of the other graphics, or the welcome message, or something like that. That way, your welcome message is your message, and depending on what you're using the pirate box for, a custom message wouldn't hurt. And speaking of what you're doing with your new gear, let's talk about what you can do with one of these kits, both library and non-related. So, before we go all Don Henley here and get down to the heart of the matter, Let's talk about an offshoot of the Pirate Box, a project called the Library Box. Now, the Library Box is very similar to the Pirate Box with a few key differences. One, the Library Box is geared towards librarians and their goals. I've joked before that the only thing librarians like more than books is cats and stats. Well, the Library Box doesn't deliver any cats, but it does offer up stats. Library boxes are set up to count the number of connections and how many times something is downloaded. Now, all of this is anonymous. There is no personal identifying information logged. But the stats are quite useful if you're dropping off a library box at a business or something like that, or an event, and you want to know how many people have used it and how many times something was downloaded. You can kind of see what the popular materials were. So the Pirate Box really has nothing like that. Also, the library box omits the ability to upload anything. Now, this, this makes sense from a librarian's point of view, uh, is because librarians typically frown on people just bringing in donated books and shelving them on their own. Naturally, they're not going to be into that on a digital level either. Along those same lines, the Kareha image board is also absent, and chat remains, but as I mentioned before, you can only do so much with that. There's also an easy facility to turn the chat off if you don't want it there. So with that in mind, you might be wondering why I'm talking about the pirate box and not the library box. And the reason is simple, because of those limitations. While I've actually used the library box in a professional setting, I think the pirate box is, quite simply, a more useful and open tool. Now, no, that doesn't mean the library box is bad. It's just a different tool for a different thing. When it comes down to it, when I'm out and about, I don't want a library box in my bag. I want a pirate box. Likewise, when I'm setting up something for library use by library customers, I wouldn't want to set up a pirate box. One is personal and the other is professional, and I think the pirate box is a little more interesting because of the personal aspect. So okay, that said, what could you use a pirate box for? Well. If you're going to take one with you and you don't want to be reliant on the grid, the power grid, you're going to need that battery pack I mentioned. Both the recommended routers and the Raspberry Pirate box itself will run off those portable charging packs that you can find all over Amazon. What you're looking for is a juice pack with a 5 volt output, the kind that will charge an iPad. So you're looking for something that can charge a tablet instead of just a smartphone. That way you know you're getting the right thing because tablets take more juice to charge than a smartphone. You can also plug into, you know, the you can just plug the USB into a micro USB cable and then power up your pirate box for hours. I, I carry the battery pack and the AC plug just so I have the flexibility to, you know, I can set it up anywhere I like. So this means that my, my pirate box can share files on the train, on the bus, at the coffee shop, at the cafe where I eat lunch, or anywhere else. That's pretty freaking slick, my friends. Moving beyond my rather idyllic world into others... The Pirate Box project can be a fantastic resource at demonstrations, protests, 
or any large gathering of people where there's a need to distribute and share information. Everybody has a smartphone, so, you know, they can use that with the pirate box. Now, I know that that's a, uh, that's a glib statement. Everybody has a smartphone, but lots of people do. So this gives you a tool to use to distribute that information. The chat and the forum on the pirate box, the, that allows for easy communication. And like I said, everything is anonymous. So nothing's tracked. One can't see if people have downloaded something from the box, nor how many people have downloaded anything at all from the box. The small form factor means that this thing easily disappears into a purse or a backpack, even if you've got the battery pack plugged in. Which brings me to a gripe that arises from all of the pictures I've seen online of various Pirate Box projects. If you're bored, do a Google image search for Pirate Box. You'll see some great, some great ideas, some great projects. But look, folks, I totally understand the idea of making this thing and then slapping a Jolly Roger decal on it, you know, or the Pirate Bay's logo or something like that. But for my needs, my ideas... Incognito is really the way to go. If you, you know what's going to attract a lot of unnecessary attention on a subway or at the park or someplace like that? A big black lunchbox looking thing with an antenna sticking out of it and a skull and crossbones on the side of it. When you do something like that that just begs for attention, you're going to get it. So for my money and from my standpoint, the best pirate box is the one that doesn't look like anything because it's never directly seen. It's a hell of a lot harder to find an active pirate box when you have almost no idea where it is or who's operating it. When the operator is all but flying a flag above their device, well, that's, that's going to garner some looks from people you might not want to attract. Just saying. So if you check out the mods and the forums, uh, you will find some great ideas to sort of extend and modify your library box. Or, I'm sorry, your pirate box. But the one that really tickles me is turning the pirate box into a radio. Now, I don't mean like a... There, there, is, a, uh, there is a pirate radio thing out there where you can hook up an antenna to the GPIO ports on your uh, on your Raspberry Pi and create an antenna and actually broadcast over FM and stuff like that. No, no, no. This is being able to upload and stream media files uh, as if it were like an internet radio. So, okay, so being able to upload and stream media files could really be useful in a protest or activist situation where you need to get your message out to a group of people, but you don't necessarily want to broadcast it on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that. Beyond the streets, you can also use the box to collect and distribute information at a conference. I've picked up on active pirate boxes at a couple of library conferences where people had the presentations on the device, along with entertaining things for those who might need something to watch or listen to after the customary night at the pub. I went to a conference once where they were having all kinds of issues with the Wi-Fi. Let me tell you, folks, if you're at a conference with a bunch of librarians and the Wi-Fi doesn't work, that's a bad time. That is a supremely bad time. No one is having a good time. But someone had a pirate box, along with another person that was rocking a library box, and they were using it to distribute the presentations, notes, contact information, and, as I said, some media files like music and movies for people who might get a little bored or you just need something to do after a night out on the town with some friends. So, being able to deliver information and services to a disconnected community is also a powerful thing, and pirate boxes are great for that. They've been used to bring information and files to African villages and to the war zones of the Middle East and to Occupy movements. The Pirate Box is a hyper-local, open-source information delivery system utilizing offline networking. It runs off of a battery pack and slips into a cargo pocket or backpack for concealment and easy portability. Good God, mate. Now that is a tool for a cyberpunk librarian. Oh, 
And that about wraps up this episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in, and I seriously hope you give this Raspberry Pirate Box, or just the regular Pirate Box thing, a try. They are both wonderful little projects. They're a lot of fun, and they can be incredibly useful depending on the things that you get up to, both at your library and in your personal life. So, hey, check it out. You'll find links in the show notes to a bunch of cool stuff at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. The song I'm currently digging on is Halon by Christian Bjorklund. Earlier in the show, you heard Runtime Error by Peter Sharp and Cylinder 3 by Chris Zabriskie. As always, the show is open with Belly Dance at Abisu by Ryo Miyashita, and you can pick up links to those songs in the show notes as well. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Awesome people doing awesome things, preserving and saving some of the best digital content ever made online and off. you got to check them out just for the classic video games and stuff like that. Oh, my God. The Archive has just got so much great stuff, and they're adding more and more every day. So check them out at archive.org. And thank you so much for hosting podcasts and shows like this and podcasts and shows that are nothing like this at all. If you're into picking up your audio on a video site, you can check us out on youtube.com slash cyberpunk librarian, where this show is posted pretty much at almost exactly the same time as it goes live on the RSS feed and iTunes and things like that. I have to push a couple buttons to make it happen. So, you know, give me 10 seconds if, you know, if that's your bag. You can also join uh, join the discussion and find out what's going on at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. I occasionally post there and let you know what's going on with the show and what's coming up and all of that kind of thing. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, I certainly encourage you to do so. If you have questions, comments, an idea for a future show, or anything like that, I would love to hear from you regardless. You can hit me up on Twitter. I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. I am also on Google Plus at google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. And if you prefer the old-fashioned SMTP method of communication, which I certainly do from time to time, you can hit me up at cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Anything you'd like to say or any ideas you'd like me to talk about, that's always good stuff. But for now, I'm going to get out of here. Once again, I apologize for the show being so late, but if it makes you feel any better, the next show topic is already selected. I'm already working on the script for it, so hopefully we get this one out on time. Wouldn't that be a lovely change? But for now, I bid you goodbye. I hope you have a great couple weeks. And hey, you don't have to be high-tech to be low-budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll catch you again on the next show.